Joy. I uh, grew up in Kentucky, but moved here in 2005. Moved around a little bit more and then came back. Uh, I don't think I would, I mean, there's a lot of great places to live, but there's just something so contagious, I think, about Nashville that keeps us here. Um, very proud to live here uh, in this region, even though sometimes it's really hot and humid, but we bear through it. It's just part of it. If it was all easy, I think I often say that um, we need the kind of r more rough seasons to appreciate the good weather. Because if it was, I mean, probably California would disagree with me, but I like the, the variation. So we are here to talk about native plants. And that's kind of my specialty here at Bates Nursery. Um, I've been here for four years, but I've been in the industry for about 10. Um, I still have a ton more to learn, but I really, really love what I do. And I love learning about specifically native plants, plants in general. Um, it's just one of those professions that you, that if you're interested in it and passionate about it, it never gets old. And there's always something new to learn. So most important thing um, I wanna say is that uh, for a long time in the industry, the main argument for why we should be planting native plants, and usually it was from the industry side of things to kind of get people interested in it, is that they're low maintenance. And, you know, like, because everybody wants low maintenance, I just want to, you know, low maintenance plant, okay. Um, and part of that's true, but the more important reason that we need to be talking about is because native plants support our local ecosystems. 90% um, of insect herbivores are considered specialists, which means that they've evolved for thousands of years with specific plants and their life cycles revolve around them. They can't just go out and eat any plant. It has to be the plant or plants that they've evolved to eat. The most common relationship most people are aware of is that between milkweed and monarchs. And that was kind of the gateway. Like once everyone started about the, started to talk about the decline in, in monarchs, um, I will say now because that's such a popular conversation going on right now that probably at least three people a day come in looking for milkweed, which makes me extremely happy. Um, but what we need to um, keep in mind is that there are countless other relationships, just like milkweed and monarchs, that we need to be considering and supporting as well. Uh, also, why these, I'll, I'll go into what this sheet is. So, Lepidoptera, host plants. That is moth and butterfly caterpillars. So, why they are so important is because they're, they are about 50% of insects they make up 50% of insects in North America. And so why do we need these insects? For a lot of reasons, one of the, one of the reasons is birds. Birds diets only, almost completely consist of insects in the spring and summer months when they are migrating, breeding, and feeding their young. Uh, so we need that, that food. And we've seen a lot of decline in birds as well. Um, another thing that native plants do is, there's, it's hard to keep up with all the research going on, but I did read a study that they studied fall berries of native and non-native plants. The non-native plants contained on average less than 1% of fat, whereas native plants contained up to 50% of fat, which when you think about how many migrating birds we have and just how our birds overwinter and that there's not a lot of food out there for them, especially as we've kind of taken away their habitat, that makes all the difference. Um, which is why we need to be planting more native plants to support their diets in the fall. Uh, and mammals as well. I mean, they rely on these plants. They've evolved with them, uh, and so they look for them. They know that they can eat acorns and um, chestnuts, which we don't have chestnuts anymore. I'll get to that later. Uh, beech nuts. So that is, that's kind of the main stick of, and it's so detailed, like our, all around us is way more diverse than we ever thought or and as we are learning more and more we're realizing that there are such intricate relationships with plants and insects and birds like even on that spirea yesterday i saw that there were two beetles mating on the flower and you see that a lot like they go to this specific flower same for goldenrod in the fall uh, blister beetles will mate on the flowers like there's just so many cool relationships that go on if we really stop and pay attention. Um, so from, I'm gonna, re, we're gonna go through this list. I'm not gonna mention everything that's on it because there's a lot of information here. It's really just, we'll touch on a few, but it's a reference in, for you to have in the future of how you can incorporate more into your landscape. Um, some have higher numbers than others. So 
that doesn't necessarily mean that those are more important, but we're talking like uh, it's keystone plants. So these are the ones that we really want to make sure that we're incorporating because they, they support a large number of, of insect species. It doesn't mean that some of the less numbers are um, not worthy to be planted, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, uh, because the relationships that exist matter as well. well so we're going to go into shade and sun, and that's two of the main kind of ecosystems that we have in Tennessee. So the woods, the forest, and then the prairie, the grasslands, and we have both. Like the whole of the United States was not wooded at one point. We had natural grasslands and prairies. And so we need to uh, conserve those as well. But let's talk about um, the forest. So in a forest, there are four layers. There's the canopy, understory, shrub, and ground layer. And there's many reasons why this is so important is because of bird habitat. Like you think about so many residential properties right now, it's either you've got canopy trees and grass. And so many bird species live in each layer and need to nest in like, there's ground uh, layer nesting birds like uh, the bobwhite quail. And so we've, we are trying to bring them back, but they have declined rapidly because we're taking away their specific habitat. Um, and you don't need to know all of that. It's just mixing in more diversity and layers into your woodland space. And also some insects um, will drop their eggs or the caterpillars drop themselves from the canopy layer. And so they browse on and develop on the ground layer. And so you think about how many properties are canopy and lawn while well, we're, we're mowing over them and they don't have that habitat to develop. Uh, specifically like wild violet. A lot of people think that's a weed and it, I guess it technically is as far as how well often it produces, but it's a host. I, I put it on the list. It hosts, uh, yeah, 26 Lepidoptera species. One of which there's a fritillary that's almost completely extinct because it, it um, is developing just as we're getting out our lawnmowers. And there's other, I think there, it's a fritillary but it's just all of these things we need to like think about of the actions that we're making and how it affects the ecosystem around us. So let's talk about canopy layer, shade trees. A few that oaks, 432 Lepidoptera species. That's the most of any native plant. Um, oaks are looked down on because of their leaf litter and the acorns, but if we can look past all of that, you can kind of see the positive in it too because they're supporting our, our squirrels and the mammals that eat the acorns. Also, the more we learn about leaf litter and how we shouldn't be mulching it up and taking it off somewhere, it's great. Those leaves do not decompose like for a while. So they stay there and they compress and they block weeds from coming up. Not perfectly, but it's good. And you want that to be mixed back into your soil because that keeps your soil healthy. All leaf litter. So oaks, an excellent choice. That one is Schumard. We've got a white oak over in the corner right there. And that's one, that's probably of all the oaks talked about, that's a lot of people's favorites. Um, I like the red oak, but there, you can't go wrong with oaks. And there's some that stay smaller than others. So you don't have to, white oak gets humongous, but there's, there are smaller ones. And so black cherry right there. Not very many black cherries, are around anymore. My neighbor actually has one across the street and they've been offered money to t take it down because they were used to build furniture. Yeah, so, but 320 Lepidoptera species, those are really good to have around to, to offer to a lot of insect herbivores. Uh, the downside to those is they do get tent caterpillars. That's one of the things that they attract, but birds eat the caterpillars. So the more, you know, the healthier the ecosystem, the more it balances out. So. The more caterpillars you have, the more the birds get the message and they come eat what you've got. Uh, it's just kind of, that's the hope anyway. I'm trying to restore some of what we've taken away. Hickory. Yep, shagbark hickory. There are plenty of hickories around here. You don't see them always sold because they're really, really slow. I think shagbark hickory, it's either 20 or 40 years it takes to develop nuts. Um, not a lot of people want to wait around for that, uh, but when it's, you know, the average age I think is around 200 years 
really a life cycle that isn't too bad, but it's just about, you know, sometimes we're planning things that we don't ever get to enjoy, but somebody else will. Yeah, they're majestic. Um, now we've got basswood, which is on your left. That is a really good one. I haven't talked much about bees yet, but there's between 3,600 and 4,000 special or bees that are native to North America. Uh, honeybee is actually not native. Uh, most of the specialist bees do, don't have hives. They will either burrow in hollow stems it gets really intricate and there's a lot more research that's being done on right now. But the basswood, when it blooms in the spring, is, is a very popular bloom for our native bee species. So it's, it's good to have if you've got the space for it because they, they not only get tall, they get really wide as well. Uh, beach, You're, the beach is behind you. Yeah, that's American Beach. We definitely have a ton of those. If you go hiking in our woodland areas around town, Beeman Park, most of the understory is actually, there's a lot of beach. Um, they create, they produce beach nuts, which is really good for our native wildlife, deer, squirrels. Um, so that is also a good one to consider. And 119 is nothing to scoff at. And then the list goes on for the canopy trees. So I, want to, I, I do want to make note of hackberry because hackberry gets a really bad rep. It's not its fault because we were the one that introduced this aphid, um, the woolly aphid. Before that, it was, we didn't, there was no sooty mold. If you, you know, does anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I, I have mostly hackberry on my property, yeah. Um, but they support 50 or 49 lepidopter species and when they're burying, the birds go nuts. That is such a good food source for a lot of birds. Um, whereas sometimes you'll see that some birds are a little more picky, but all the birds like hackberry, even dogs, and they can eat it. It's just gross. And we can eat it too, but it's nasty. All right, understory trees. I've got dogwood here, American dogwood. There's also a less common one known called Bogota dogwood. We got one in this year. It was really pretty, I almost bought it, um, but I have no more space in my yard part of the problem of working at a nursery. Uh, but this one is re it's truly an understory tree. If you put this out in full sun, it's not going to really like it. Um, but it also produces berries that are good for the birds, hosts a lot of lepidopter species. Um, and with that said, I also want to touch on the idea of ecosystem function. Like, this isn't the only list we need to be going by because they offer a lot of other stuff too. Like, do they offer berries or nuts or um, habitat. Like there's so many things to consider that of a value. That's why I said at the beginning, like the, the ones that don't have numbers by them, they still hold value because they might produce berries or nuts. Um, so other understory trees would be smaller prunus, which would be the American plum. That's a really rare one that we have not had until this year. I was really excited we got that. We can actually eat the berries if you can fend off wildlife. Uh, it's, it's a very popular one for the birds. Let's see, we've also got willow, pussy willow. That's the well-behaved one. <laughs> and just F what, like most people think weeping willow. That one's actually not native, um, but pussy willow is. And then I've got two behind me and we're, we're here talking about, well, I'm not talking about rivers, but we're here for the rivers. These are two that you really see along the river banks that they grow naturally because they like that water. Uh, and as far as ecosystem function, they have a lot going on because when they bloom, that is one of the best ones for the early season bees. Um, 243 Lepidoptera species, which is a ton. That's on the top of the list. Uh, that might not have a place in your residential space, but definitely the Pussy Willow is worth a try. And they're just fun. Like the blooms are awesome. Decorative even. All right service berry which is right here that little creature it's we only have small service but well actually we got some 15 gallons in the other day but sometimes it's okay to start small as well that is has a lot of function um what is it 80 80 lepidoptera species it also has great fall color it produces it's a good early season bloomer for bees and it also produces fruit that we can eat and birds eat but 
like all the other ones, you got to fend off the birds because uh, someone was telling me the other day that cedar waxwings just obliterated their service berry like within a couple hours. It was gone. All right, persimmon. That one right there. Yep, that's a American persimmon. A lot of people, it's not too terribly popular because they can be a little messy, the fruit, um, but it's, it's a great, the fall color's decent. Uh, it supplies a lot of fruit for the wildlife um, and hosts, what, 49 Lepidopter, 50 Lepidopter species. Okay, so one more understory tree to talk about that I don't have an example of because we have run out and we're trying to find more is the pawpaw. So its number is only 13 but it is the only host for the zebra swallowtail, just like the monarch and the milkweed. So if we don't have pawpaw, we don't have the zebra swallowtail. So not, so we desperately need that pawpaw to keep the zebra swallowtails, even though, you know, it doesn't support a ton, it's still really good for that specific species of butterfly. All right, shrubs. There's a, there's a quite a few shrub options um, to choose from. Blueberry, one of my favorites because it's delicious. Uh, same goes if you can keep the birds off of it. It hosts a lot of Lepidopter species. There's two main types that we can, that grow uh, natively here. Um, there is rabbit eye and southern highbush. Those are the two main ones. Southern highbush really can be a self-pollinating. It always helps to have two, but you definitely need two of the rabbit eyes that bloom at the same time. There's early, early, mid and late season uh, blueberry rabbit eyes. So you have to make sure like that one's powder blue. So I would pair it with Tiff Blue or another one called Oclocanoe. Okay, I'm not used to talking this much at once. <laughs> uh, rose. We do have native roses. That is a swamp rose over there in the corner. <clears throat> There's also a Carolina rose that I don't have an example of. We sold out of that. Um, those are great host Lepidopter species, but also birds will eat the rose hips when those are ready. And I think other mammals will munch on, on the rose hips too. Sorry. There. All right, and then we've got viburnum. The main thing to talk about with viburnum, some plants like persimmon, you either have a male or a female. You need to make sure you have both. But with viburnum, it's, it's like the blueberry. Like they don't have to be male, female. They just need to be blooming at the same time and they need to have a little bit of genetic uh, diversity. So in the market, that's blue muffin. You pair it with Chicago luster and they bloom at the same time and that's what um, produces the berries. If it's, if it's a solo viburnum by itself, it's not gonna do anything unless by chance there's one growing around you. <clears throat> so that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then the last one that is actually here is coral berry or Symphorocarpus. <clears throat> That's a lot of these shrubs really get quite large, but this one stays um, relatively small, three to four feet. And the birds eat the berries as well. And then button bush, which is probably like, I can't stop talking about the button bush. It's a host for 25 Lepidopter species. It attracts a lot of pollinators. And it's, it's a later season, so you get hummingbirds that are really attracted to it, and uh, bees and butterflies. Does it get bigger than that yes. Uh, there's one called Sugar Shack that is a little bit more of a dwarf. I think it's four to five feet. That one gets six to eight feet tall. <clears throat> and that particular one is uh, Magical Moonlight. Um, what else? Oh yeah, I want it in that moment because I mentioned different t kinds, cultivars. Um, with the research that I've read so far, when you make a native plant dwarf or change its habit, that doesn't take away from its, its host ability. What matters is when you change the color of the leaf, the chemistry. <clears throat> so like Physocarpus, there's, that's on the list. Um, there's a lot of purple and amber colored leaf ones that really kind of can can throw off the insect herbivores. What about the, color of the blooms? The blooms? No, really. So even like, and I, I spoke on berries, 
blooms are different. Nectar's nectar and pollen's pollen. So <clears throat> that's kind of like, well, I'll dress up my outdoor space with a lot of annuals um, because nectar's really great for <clears throat> carbohydrates and then pollen's good for uh, proteins and other nutrients. So that, yeah, it's kind of across the board they're going to get. Now, of course, there, you, I'm sure there's more studies out there of like, you know, this type of cone flower is more, um, actually there's a lot of research on the cone flower, but yeah, some are attract more than others, but as far as like their value, they still will attract. Okay. So shade perennials, the ground layer, what we need, there's ferns, perennials and sedges. So there's a lot of native sedges. We've got quite a few, uh, native ferns that we've been working to bring more in. Christmas fern, Dixie wood fern are two options. Ostrich fern is native. That's a really popular one because you can eat the fronds. Um, but we are at the very southern tip of its happiness zone. So it's going to need a lot of water and a lot of moisture. Like how big they get in Massachusetts and Maine is not how big they get here. <clears throat> so that's something to keep in mind if you really are wanting some ostrich ferns, uh, especially for culinary use. Um, and then I didn't mention uh, vines. That's kind of, they're usually found in nature on the woodland edge. And so what I've got, we're, we're really low on vines here at Bates, but what we have right now is the American Wisteria, Amethyst Falls, and Lanacera, or Coral Honeysuckle. And that one's Major, I think it's, no, Magnifica is that one, but there's another one called Major Wheeler. <clears throat> so that is the woodland forest. Um, and there's more, but I know we're getting kind of crunched on time and it's hot. I wasn't quite, <laughs> it's very hot. Um, prairie. So mostly shrubs, grasses, perennials. That's what you mostly see. Um, this shrub is sumac and you see it growing everywhere. It's a staghorn sumac. It often gets confused with a very invasive non-native uh, tree of heaven. Um, but that the staghorn sumac and other sumacs are definitely native <clears throat> and does great in just terrible soil, rocky conditions, uh, and is, is a host. What was, what's Roos? Yeah, 50. So that's, that's great as well. All right. Ornamental grasses. We're going to flip the page. These right here, that's panicum, uh, specifically totem pole gets about 62 inches. Um, what, the birds love the seeds. Uh, and it's, it's kind of funny because you don't really think that grasses, like anything would eat grasses. But skippers are really, it's, that's mostly what is, what uses uh, panicum as a host, which is that like little small, kind of looks like a moth, but I think technically is a butterfly. And then for there's so many sun perennials, and this is my favorite time of the year at Bates because we get to see all of them start to bloom. Um, and people really get to appreciate them because in the spring, like when, when the shade perennials are kind of showing off, it's just a sea of green out there and it doesn't really inspire anyone to uh, <laughs> try them. So now's the time to really get those um, out the door. Solidago is the probably my favorite perennial just because it is really great in ecosystem function and also it's kind of the underdog people think it's a weed we do not sneeze because of goldenrod that is uh ragweed so <laughs> that doesn't cause our allergies i mean maybe a little bit but not like ragweed um another thing about solidago and it has hollow stems and so a lot of uh specialist bees will house in their stems over the winter same with um the american uh Sambucus elderberry. That's another really popular one for overwintering insects because of the hollow stems. And it is a mid to late season bloomer. And then Joe pie weed, which is over here. That's another great mid to late season bloomer, uh, host for 30. Um, kind of that it pairs usually in, in the landscape, you'll see goldenrod, Joe pie weed and iron weed together. That's, that's their natural habitat. Uh, they typically grow in the same conditions, kind of icky soil, a little like maybe flooding situation going on. Uh, good for rain gardens. So that is, uh, ironweed is Vernonia and that's a host for 20. And Baptisia 
Yeah. There's a lot of different types of Aptesia now. They've done a little, they've kind of gone a little crazy with breeding. Um, but there's a, this one is lemon meringue. There's also purple smoke is a good one, Carolina moonlight, um, or just straight species is, are good options as well. And that's, that's quite a good size host for 17. But also like you get a lot of other value with the perennials because of the blooms and the pollinators. They might host a little bit less, but um, they still offer a lot of function in the landscape. I didn't grab any black eyed Susans, but that's like, you know, everybody knows black eyed Susans. That's like, you know, my grandma had it, but it doesn't take away from their actual value. Um, it's that, yes, it's an old school plant, but it definitely has a place in your landscape. And there's tons of species of Rudbeckia, not just that typical one that you always see. There's some that get eight, nine feet tall. Um, so we have quite a few options over there to choose from. And aster would be another really great uh, late season bloomer. It blooms purple. I think most of us are probably familiar with asters, but we have quite a few native ones um, that you might not be aware of. Um, I would say that October skies and radon's favorite, which this is October skies. Ugh. And they get a little kind of like wiry and uh, make sure you give them enough sun or else they'll get really floppy. There's some sun perennials that you can pull off in the shade, but that I wouldn't say is one of them. Uh, and so let's talk about coneflower. It's only a host for one, but when those are in bloom, that's when the pollinators really gravitate towards them. And there was a um, study out of Mount Cuba Center, which is I think Delaware, somewhere on the East Coast, I can't remember, that they did a study on coneflower and pollinators and how much we're attracted to what. And so top of the list was actually a white one, which I would have thought, because you often hear that like pollinators aren't really attracted to white and that's so not true. Um, that one was called Fragrant Angel, the one, and then Purpurea, which is straight species, that got second. And then Ruby Star, which I've got over here, that got third. But a lot of the hybrids, as long as they're not double blooms, um, they offer just as much, they will attract and also the birds will eat the seeds. It's the double blooms, blooms that really take away their value. All right, I think, oh, let's talk about Asclepius. The main three that we carry, which typically we only have two, this is swamp milkweed, which gets much taller. Um, I would say that the caterpillars prefer this leaf a little bit more, but we see it on the tuberosa as well. And then we, uh, we got this in for the first time uh, successfully. <laughs> and this is the common milkweed. And this can be a little difficult to grow in a garden situation because it reseeds like crazy. So you need to give it a lot of space. Um, if you've got like that place in your yard that gets a lot of sun, you don't have anything else going on over there, just let it go. But don't expect it to be three by three and well behaved because it won't be. But that is, that's another really good one for the caterpillars. So I think that I'm not going to go all over all of them, um, but I just want to kind of go back to, we've lost a lot of our wild spaces. Like most of, if we were to just rely on our national parks and our, our forests, there's not enough. Like now, I think 86% east of the Mississippi is considered private property. So we are it. We are the new habitat for um, these insects and the animals and the birds. Uh, it's our backyards and what we decide to put into our properties can either affect you know our ecosystems in a positive way not at all or in a negative way like invasive species so the, the decisions we make matter um, and I also it can be overwhelming it's a lot of information uh, you don't know where to start so start small like if you if a plant dies choose a native to take its place or if you've got a little area that you've been wanting to do something, make that little circle, start off as a native pollinator garden or just start with natives. And I don't wanna, I'm not here to, I, clearly I work at a garden center and we sell a lot of plants. I just happen to be super passionate about this and I know how much it matters. Um, but you don't have to go tear out all your non-natives. That's not the point. It's to really learn why these natives are so important. Uh, I wanna, discuss a few books with you that really helped me. 
I'm embarrassed. I, this is bringing nature home, Doug, Doug Tallamy. I saw him speak in 2012 and I read his book this winter. Um, and I got that book then and it's, this is a game changer and it has been, he, he wrote it in 2008 and he is the reason why this native conversation has becoming more mainstream, why it's getting into more conversations. And I also wanna note with all of the negative things about COVID, the past year and a half, uh, the conversation, because I'm talking about plants all day long and I'm constantly observing um, what people are coming and looking for and the conversations that we're having and just how much more people are talking about natives is really encouraging. Uh, the message is getting out there and he has a lot to do with it um, because he started really um, kind of waving the flag and then other people joined in. And so he wrote another book, Nature's Best Hope. Um, he wrote this in 2019 and it was kind of a, hey, like I wrote this book a while ago and are we, are we doing enough? Are we, you know, is the message getting out there? So it was just kind of a big, big poke. I think his latest book was um, Native Oak. Or yeah, yeah, The Nature of Oaks or something. Yeah, I haven't, that's on the wish list. <laughs> that's probably, as far as like in the weeds, that will be an interesting read, but probably very technical. Um, this is, if you're interested in birds, I highly recommend this book. It's Sharon Sorensen, Planting Native, um, to attract birds to your yard. And she, like Doug, tell me can often be kind of, um, not difficult to read, just there's a lot of information in there and it gets kind of heady. Whereas she kind of approaches it more of an, emo not pure emotion, but it's, it's an easier read. And it's really kind of poetic the way she says things. Uh, so I highly recommend that one as well. Birding is definitely, speaking of the, the last year and a half, like birding has exploded in popularity and I definitely have become one of those um, avid. I'm trying to learn as much as I can about them because it's fascinating. Uh, how, many, how many birds we have and what they need, what they eat and their different um, habitats, whether they migrate or not, it's just, it is fascinating. And then if you're interested in a, um, making your yard more of a habitat this is a perfect place to start this is the national wild federation wildlife federation and it kind of just goes through the steps of how to make your landscape more biodiverse and to attract more wildlife um, right down to like for, there, she all, or this one also talks a lot about frogs and amphibians and having like trying to do a natural pond if you have the space for it but it's just and then they they will you have to meet certain criteria, but you can sign up to have it. You pay, I think, $20, $20, and then you get a sign in your yard that says National Wildlife Federation Habitat. Um, so I would recommend that as well. But uh, the last thing I want to just stress is just how important, how important our role is and to take it seriously. Like, take a look at your yard and see how you can um, attract more wildlife into your your spaces that's I think that's about it I think we're all about to die of heat I am this is only we've only had two I mean this is this is the first day still be hot. <laughs> yeah yeah are there any questions Not that I know specifically. Um, hmm, who would be doing that? I mean, I'm sure that probably the Tennessee, oh, and I didn't even mention this book. I bet they've got something on it. This is the Wildflowers of Tennessee, okay. but the Tennessee Native Plant Society, I bet they have a list. Okay, cool. Yeah, and they're a great resource. This is a great book too. Were there any other questions? Okay. Yes, they do. And we've been working on that. So the majority of the part sun natives are in C10 um, and a little bit in C9. And, the, and there's a little bit of understory trees in there as well. And then in the front of B8, it has to be spaced out because there's different conditions that they require. So in front of B8 are things that could take more moisture if they had it in full sun, like buttonbush and uh, sweet spire. 
but it's, we kind of did it strategically because that gets a lot of irrigation on our lot. So we just put things that like it anyway. Um, and then over here we, in A11, we've got all of our ornamental grasses. In A12 is where all the native grasses are. And at the back of A11 is the sun um, shrubs, native shrubs. And then over here in the perennials, they're not spaced out because we do everything alphabetically. It just helps with putting things away. Um, but there are plenty of options in both shade and sun perennials. And then we've started to um, kind of, it's hard with the, our tree lot because we get so many trees and, and you know, doing a native and a non-native section is, can be difficult. But right now, at least we've got the five gallon material spaced out that's native and non-native. This? <laughs> this is definitely one of the, it could be on a riparian buffer. This is Amorpha, or false indigo, um, which false indigo is also Baptisia. That's where common names get confusing. Um, but it blooms kind of this spiky purple bloom and then yellow on the, the tips of the bloom. It's really pretty. Uh, but it definitely can handle a lot of abuse and terrible conditions. False indigo? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Amorpha. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it can get quite tall, like 8 to 10 feet. But most people will cut it all the way back to the ground and let it start over in the springtime, or at least to like 24 inches. Is it a honey locust? Probably. Yeah, because I mean, yes. Yep. Yes, they are. You don't want to go give it a hug. <laughs> and yeah oh yeah you so, said it too if i know somewhere in my yard like i either want to designate a pollinator garden rain garden native plants whatever it is but i don't know where to start can i come in here and you guys help yep design that mm -hmm. or we kind of have to have yeah and i also want to take this this question to say there are so many resources out there too like the xerces society and doug talmy has his own website now uh homegrown national park that you can go and kind of learn more. Like everyone really, at, not, a, not everybody probably likes Instagram, has Instagram, but if you follow the hashtag native plants, you will see a lot. <laughs> you will start, your feed will start showing you all the good work that's going on and a lot of good information.